Okay, I'm ready to go. Welcome to the Teledyne E2B Direct KA Band Conversion discussion here today. Thank you for joining and uh, I hope you're enjoying the 2020 IEEE radar conference that's going on uh, as well as these sessions that uh, we've done. So hopefully on your screen you see my presentation. I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, Teledyne E2B first and some of the key contacts for this. I'll start with uh, the two gentlemen here, Romain and Stefan, are the two applications engineers in our business unit that work with our RF converters. These are converters, both ADCs and DACs, that go direct from digital to RF or from RF to digital. And in this band, uh, this case, we're going to be talking about clear up into the KA band. Romain is a RF and data converter expert. Stefan is an FPGA expert. So at one end of this, you're going to have an FPGA or an ASIC. And at the other end, you'll have uh, some RF signal. So these two guys together uh, work to support you and our other customers as we uh, do these really high speed data converters. Depending on where you're located, you'll see some of the field applications engineers that we have in the company that support these products. Andrew Glasgow Jones and Julian Cochard are both based in Grenoble and support Europe, Middle East, Africa, India. They support a wide piece of the country. And then Mark Stackler is based uh, near Hong Kong and he does uh, the Asia, Asia Pacific region as far as sales and applications. And I do kind of the same thing. My title is business development manager, but I do technical and business support for North America. And I rely very heavily on these two guys uh, to give me the right technical answers that I can give to customers. A uh, little bit about Teledyne E2B, uh, particularly the semiconductor version or portion of Teledyne E2B if you don't know us. And, and we do uh, products like we'll talk about today, these high speed converters. We also do high reliability processors. This is actually a module that's got a a uh, gigaflop uh, microprocessor along with a memory and a bunch of passives on a module. And both of these are set up to work in the space markets, the defense markets, and then you see also avionics for the processors and industrial, and that's things like uh, test and measurement and, and some communications uh, in the high-speed data converters. We also have uh, uh, products that fit into the, that fit around these products. Uh, we have space grade RF products also in the defense world. So if you're at even higher RF, or if you want to do mixing and amplifying and filtering in the RF domain, we have products there. And then we have products to pr provide the power to these devices. Every one of these devices always has power supplies associated with it. An outline of what I'll talk about. I'll talk about why do you want direct conversion to KA band uh, or other bands, whether it's LS, C, X, whatever band you're working in. Um, a little bit about a D to A converter that's currently in characterization. It's the early phases for it of its prototypes. And then another, uh, an A to D actually, that's a prototype as well. Uh, both of them are 12 bits. Uh, they both operate around 12 giga samples per second. And they both have bandwidths that allow operation direct RF connections in the K and KA band uh, areas. Okay. Also talk a little bit about system in a package. As I mentioned earlier, FPGAs are usually sitting next to our uh, data converters and we're working on putting data converters and FPGAs together in a single package. And I'll talk about that more at the end. And then a few applications that uh, we've seen that we're involved with around the world. So why do you want to do direct conversion into KA band? 
Uh, we've looked at things going kind of historically back in time where uh, if you were working at these really high bands, uh, you had to do some sort of analog mix or modulate or uh, analog frequency translation from an A to D that e even in the 90s we could do into L bands. So we could do in the gigahertz type uh, bands. And <clears throat> so you had to still have RF conversion. More recently, we've seen parts and we have parts and, and some of the other uh, companies on the they're in the market have parts that can go up into the six gigahertz, eight gigahertz range. So you can go directly there with RF, but then if you go further into X band and KU and KA band, you still need frequency translation. So if you go with one of these parts that can go directly into the K band, you can do the signals directly from the A to D or out of the DAC at RF. So it gives you a lot of things. As you move up along this, this nice gold curve, you gain flexibility. You can define the band you're in with software. You can move it around with agility, either in the band or, or to the, a different band. You can set up dynamic frequency plans that change as you're changing what you're doing. You can op actually operate in more than one band at a time, as long as you're careful about how you manage the frequency planning. And you can also work across bands, a very similar kind of thing. So kind of pictorially, this is this same uh, steps that we've made here. This one goes even further back in time. Still done today, super heterodyne uh, down conversion in this case, where you start at the antenna. Antenna and LNA and bandpass filter, you'll see them in every version of this. That's the kind of frequency dependent pieces at RF. In the super heterodyne, you had uh, several stages of mix, fi amplify filter, mix, amplify filter, and you got two baseband ADCs. They were typically fairly narrow bands, so you needed a lot of them to look at a wide bandwidth, and you needed all this RF to do the conversion. If we go here to like 1995, you start seeing these really wide band ADCs. So now you come in a real mix down filter. Uh, sorry, amplify and filter, and there may be another amplifier here, actually, and then into the ADC. So this greatly simplified the system, made it more flexible, headed all in the right direction here. And if you go to the place where, in fact, you can sample directly at your RF frequency, you get this very, very simplified, and it's probably oversimplified, but a very, very simplified uh, version of the signal chain. Now, one of the bright guys, and I think it was in our team, said, you shouldn't draw it this way because what's really happening is this block, the digital block, is actually doing more and more work. So it should be getting bigger. And it is doing more and more work. But because of the scaling in the digital domain, you actually have huge benefits of uh, the reduction in size and power that happens with scaling. So. Reduce size, reduce weight, reduce cost, reduce complexity. Complexity. All of those things are uh, outcomes of moving to these simplified systems. So first, I'm going to talk about the DAC that we've got uh, in its early phases of it. It's in its uh, prototype phase, so we're characterizing it and testing it and doing all kinds of great things with it. It is a dual. So two channels, 12 bit, D to A, that's 12 giga samples per second. That's the full clock rate. And you can in fact get full Nyquist band performance out of it in what we call its real mode. Uh, it's got digital filters. And one of the key things that makes it capable into the K band is it's got 25 gigahertz of 3 dB bandwidth and that's actually usable above that. So we can do things, uh, we've looked at things up to 21 gigahertz. There's multiple output modes, kind of the traditional DAC, non-return to zero mode, where you've got uh, most of the power in the first and second Nyquist band, RF mode or mixed mode that's used by a lot of DACs that pushes the power into the second and third Nyquist band. And then there's a fourth or fourth mode, third mode, sorry. I uh, gotta be able to count right here, but the uh, third mode that's called 2RF, uh, where we double clock the DAC core itself. So it's running at twice the frequency. 
and it pushes power into the third and fourth and a little bit into the fifth Nyquist sound. So you can continue to operate up into these very high frequencies with nice power output. You can synchronize these things very well. A lot of the systems you're in are probably array based. So these two parts are easy to synchronize. They're on the same chip, they're matched, all this. But we've also made it very easy to synchronize between multiple packages, so multiple DACs. So you can do many more uh, DACs together. Uh, it uses serialized data. This is EasyStream, which we have worked on. It's a simplified version. It's very light, very much physically like JSD204B and PCI Express. It's, so it's got uh, deserializers at this end, serializers at the other end. And so the question always is, uh, what do I do at the other end? And the answer is we provide that for you. So we provide all the IP that you need to put into your FPGA uh, to make this connection. It's got a whole bunch of digital blocks. I won't go into a lot of detail, but there's interpolation modes, 4, 8, and 16. We do this digital up conversion in here with a, a digital modulator. You can hop with the direct digital, um, you can frequency hop and you can do direct digital synthesis with a chirp in here. And then we can do uh, beam forming activities in here, tweaking the gain and the phase and the offset of each of the channels as they come in so you can do proper beam forming. A little bit about the package, it's in a 20 by 20 high thermal coefficient of expansion Rojas package. It also comes with tin lead, it turns out, and it has been designed for space. So here's a real, real simple view of the package. It's got this uh, ceramic glass substrate, a flip chip part inside, a nice copper heat spreader on the top and package, and uh, it is non-hermetic ceramic, so it's available, will be available in QMLY standard. Few performance specs of the part. These are target specs simulated, but it turns out as we start to measure this, it looks like this. Uh, so SFDR numbers as you go from baseband up into X band, up into K band. So you see it does uh, roll off some. Uh, the E knob, again, holds between about eight and nine bits across a very wide bandwidth range and the noise spectral density or the noise floor uh, is very constant across many bands. Um, we've looked at NPR for those of you in the communications world or that have noise-like signals in your system where you've got lots and lots of uh, tones or, or spread uh, power and it non-return to zero mode in the first Nyquist zone. So think about first Nyquist is DC to six gigahertz in this case. So in the middle of that, we have about 45 dB and noise power ratio. You move into the second Nyquist zone, so now you're between six and 12. So let's say you're at 10 gigahertz, you're at about 40 dB of NPR. We have been measuring this part in our lab. We're getting ready at uh, sometime late this year to start sampling this part on eval boards. Um, so that is coming up, but we started to measure the device. And here's, here's a measurement at 18 gigahertz, 18.25, it says single tone. And you can see some harmonics here, uh, some other spurs that are related to the uh, processing that's happening, but about 45 dBc SFDR on this part. Uh, we also have the ability internally to generate a comb, uh, just a bunch of, of signals across the band. And you see, we do this to look at what does the shape of this thing really look like across frequency right now. This is the power envelope we can achieve. So at uh, it's right around zero dBm at very low frequencies. Get up in this fairly broadband between six and 20 gigahertz, and we can maintain about a minus 10 dBm signal. And just remember that uh, one of the goals is to get this up into the, the 20, 30 gigahertz range, and you can see that we can generate power up into that mode quite well. Okay. Now, I, uh, almost, I, I won't say every system, but most systems need the transmit side, the DAC, but they also need the receive side. So we're working on a companion ABC. 
Uh, it is also at 12 giga samples per second, 12 bits, uh, more than 30 gigahertz of bandwidth on the part. And this is a prototype version of this thing. Uh, there'll be a different version later, but this is the prototype. We built the track and hold first on this thing because that's the critical uh, performance determining component in any system like this where it's a sample system. So one of the things we did is we made the input single-ended. At some point, now most of these systems start out, the antenna, the filter, the LNA are single-ended. The part inside tends to be differential. So a lot of times there's a ballon that sits outside. We decided to make it so you didn't have to do a ballon in your system. We did it so it's single-ended both on the input and on the clock. So you bring in your signal up to about 40 gigahertz here. You bring in your clock, in this case, 12 gigahertz. And then we put it into some existing A to Ds that we have. These are two A to Ds that are both 6.4 giga samples per second. So you can interleave them, synchronize them with this nice little signal here, interleave them, and you get 12 uh, giga samples per second. So input is at 40 gigahertz. We're sampling at 12 gigahertz and it puts out data on this easy stream protocol, which is the same one I talked about, the serialized data stream uh, on 16 high-speed serial lanes. So it is a multi-die SIP. You see the track and hold here, the two ADCs. This is a, shows some of the pinout uh, key points where the clock comes in, where the signal comes in, uh, sorry, clock signal and synchronization. Uh, pins, so you've got sync in and sync out. Um, it is uh, right now in, again, it's for early, early phases of characterization, and we've been uh, measuring some parts on the bench, and since we're looking at this thing up to K-band, but we wanted to look at everything. So we, from DC, so zero, to 30 gigahertz, we made measurements on this part on our bench. And this is SFDR versus uh, input frequency. It turns out that this was done at 10 giga samples per second. And you see it is very flat performance uh, from DC right on up to 30 gigahertz. Uh, and you see the different bands called out here. Uh, it does go up beyond this. We just, the measurement was only done to 30. So here's just some individual single tone measurements in K band. Uh, with an input 6 dB below full scale, you see second and third harmonics dominate. That's the just kind of the big analog nonlinearities that you always see in these things. X band, we have a similar size signal here, and you see H2 and H3. And then at uh, C band here, minus six, same kind of thing. So similar numbers, and those are reflected in what you see over on this plot. Here's our bench setup and, and it gets a little complicated. This is so we can force temperature, so we can look at it over temperature. Um, here's a board that just captures the data and then here's the board that has the converter on it. Okay, now I talked about this at the start, but uh, one of the things we're working on today is taking these same uh, components that already exist. Okay, so th these are the DACs I was just showing you. This is the same ADC that's inside this this other module. So it's the same ADC that sits here that exists today too. And we've taken an FPGA from our friends at Xilinx and put them together. Uh, this happens to be a mechanical sample. I think the, the real one will be a little bit different layout, but uh, put them together on a board uh, or in a module so that we can test them together. And why do we want to do that? Uh, we're doing this up through space grade. So whether you're Neo, Geo, Leo, or on the ground, you could use this up to K-band. Um, we are partnering with Xilinx on this. This SIP gives you advantages in size. It gives you advantages that all the interfaces are already laid out, tested, verified, characterized, checked out over the whole, uh, all the frequency bands, as well as all the uh, reliability uh, conditions that you can have. So it gives you this all-in-one 
radiation tolerant, if you're in space, that matters, right? Uh, system in a package, and it is designed for space flight, which is a very rigorous testing that's required, very high reliability, and very long uh, lifetime is required. So a block diagram of this same, uh, same system is shown here. It has this quad channel. It's a, actually a C-band uh, ADC. And then it has two of these dual uh, DACs on board that are clear up to KA-band capable. Uh, at some point, we'll replace this with the uh, K-band capable ADC. But for today, this is the uh, is being built actually for a uh, particular mission, and it doesn't need uh, K-band at this point. So, in summary, uh, we're building parts for applications like radar, and you can see some of the different kinds of radars you might be involved in. Uh, since you're at a radar conference, I would expect, or you're virtually attending a radar conference, I expect you're involved in some of these kind of things, or radio astronomy. Uh, some of these are, are uh, in development right now. Some of them are quite large, and uh, these are places where we can see components like this on the ground. In telecommunications, it could be a mix of space and, uh, and uh, terrestrial. And then in EW and electronic intelligence, just there's always this need for more and more bandwidth. So you can see wider bandwidths. You don't have to have down converters. Here's this nice little black diagram that your RF at this point, your RF at this point, and what sits in the middle is the RF capable ADC and the DAC converting to digital and all the processing and memory and everything happens in the digital domain. So this is why we're working very hard to push the bandwidths to allow bandwidths clear into the K-band and to allow you to have a simpler, more robust, easier to use, easier to program system. So I thank you for attending today. I hope uh, you uh, come back to us with questions about these uh, products and how they can be used in your systems and uh, hope you have a the rest of the conference that you're attending, I hope it goes very well for you. Thank you.